You know, I usually enjoy Jonathan Haidt's perspective. His research is interesting, and he's an adept communicator. I really do appreciate what he does. That said, his take on the new atheists, which those of us in the atheist community call the Four Horsemen, is frustrating to say the least. I stumbled across a video of his lecture titled The Rationalist Delusion in Moral Psychology and found it contained a portion absolutely overdue for a response. I think you'll see what I mean. Now, I, I've had some dealings with the, the new atheists, um, and it's always been rather unpleasant. Uh, and what I've come to see is that they, you know, they deny religion, but actually they, they show all the same um, psychology of religion that religious people do. Lots of people have pointed that out, but I want to specifically add that what they sacralize is reason. Understand that Haidt comes from a mostly Durkheimian view of religion in saying this. That basically means that any group unified under a system of practices and beliefs relative to sacred things and forbidden things, he calls religious. There needn't be any supernatural elements to a group's shared beliefs for him to call them religious. What he means by this is not quite what someone like Ken Ham means when they say atheists are religious. Sacralizing reason, though? In Haidt's view of religion, I could understand the rationale behind his statement if he defined sacred as simply highly valued or loyally abided, but that doesn't seem to be at all what he means. I tried to give you the benefit of the doubt, Haidt, but then you followed up this assertion with something completely ridiculous. You know, if you sacralize Jesus Christ, or you sacralize some ancestor, you know, that binds your group together, and you might say, well, other, other people are infidels. But that's not really so insulting. If you sacralize reason, then what are your enemies? They're irrational. They're stupid. Yes, of course, as it is written in the book of Dennett, if your very own brother or your son or daughter or the wife you love or your closest friend secretly entices you saying, let us go and worship other reasons, you must certainly put them to death. And as Hitchens said, and kill them wherever you find them and turn them out from where they have turned you out and irrationality is worse than killing. Plus, everyone knows that atheists who advocate for reason are prone to stripping basic human rights away from people who disagree with them, and in some countries even throw them off of buildings. Seriously, this has got to be one of the most ignorant statements I've ever heard from someone of Haidt's esteem within their own field. It's really worse to call someone irrational or even stupid than it is to say that they deserve eternal torture. Calling someone an infidel is not just identifying them as an outsider. Historically, it's been used to denote those deserving of a fate worse than death and has been the criminal charge of those brutally murdered by religious leaders. I posit that it would take incredible sadistic creativity to come up with an insult worse than that. Mind that all of this stands even when, for the sake of argument, we grant the proposition that the four horsemen sacralize reason in such a way that creates an in-group consisting of those who follow suit. If we continue to grant that, this still doesn't imply that those who don't sacralize reason are an inherent enemy or are stupid. I and other atheists like me are not of the opinion that believers are stupid. Irrationality does not imply stupidity. Based on the method by which I come to my beliefs as an atheist, I have no reason to think that believers are inherently stupid. I was one. Although I'm not sure Christians specifically can say the same in regard to atheists. Surely, Jonathan, as an atheist yourself, you've had Psalm 14.1 hurled at you a time or two. You know, that's the verse that says, The fool has said in his heart there is no God. It sounds to me like justification for calling outsiders stupid on top of already calling them infidels. Um, so this is the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. We are liberated by calculation and reason to visit regions of possibility that had once seemed out of bounds or inhabited by dragons. This is the rationalist delusion. This is what Plato believed. Reason is our highest attribute. It works beautifully if we can just rip uh, religion out, and if we can just let ev teach everybody to reason, uh, then we'll be fine. So from Dawkins citing the utility of reason, you're taking that he's asserted that reason will fix all humanity's problems? I honestly have trouble believing that you even mean to say that, so I won't spend much time on this. No one here is claiming to have found the answer to all humanity's problems, and I think that's very apparent. Proclaiming the utility of a tool does not imply that tool's perfection. I will not claim that you think your proposal of intuitionism at the end of this talk will perfect anyone's life, because you haven't stated that it would do anything other than improve it. Just stop with the straw manning already. Um, this is Sam Harris's Project Reason, Spreading Science and Secular Values. We're going to encourage critical thinking and erode the influence of dogmatism, superstition, and bigotry. Um, so it would be interesting to know whether they themselves have been successful in their critical thinking whether they've eliminated dogmatism from their own thinking. That would be very interesting to know. The, the similarity among all these guys 
um, with the exception of Dan Din. Dan's a little bit different. But the similarity of most of them and their style was such that I thought, well, let me test this. Are they really more dogmatic than other scientists? So I, I took the full text of a bunch of books, and I ran it through the Luke program, Linguistic Inquiry Word Count. It counts up words and puts them in. It has, uh, uh, Jamie Pennebaker has validated with all kinds of different categories. And there were two categories that were a priori relevant. One was anger. How angry are they? The other was certainty. If you're, if you're fighting dogmatism, you should be open-minded, right? But if you're dogmatic, you're always saying, certainly it's the case. It's always the case. It's never the case. So for anger words, I took, so these are all the, um, this is the complete, this is the word count, the percentage of words in L, uh, Sober and Wilson's book, um, uh, Unto Others, uh, Dan Dennett's book, so Dan Dennett, so he's a new atheist, but he's not angry. Um, uh, this is my book, The uh, Happiness Hypothesis, and Scott, so books on religion, um, uh, the, the anger rate in those books is relatively low. Um, uh, but now here we have Harris and Dawkins, much higher and especially Harris. So that validates what we know. When you read it, that's what you hear. Again, I could, for the sake of the argument, grant you your idea that Dawkins and Harris are particularly angry, but still easily contest your overall claim. Since when does anger imply dogmatism? If someone doesn't communicate angrily, does that mean they aren't dogmatic? Are the vast majority of church leaders non-dogmatic because they don't communicate angrily most of the time? On the flip side, were American abolitionists dogmatic because they were angry? Jonathan, when you yourself get angry about far-left pandering in American universities, are you being dogmatic or are you just upset about perceived injustice or harm? Could it be that Dawkins and Harris are angry for similar, valid reasons and aren't being forceful so much as passionate? Sam Harris especially writes about ideologically countering terrorism. Surely even the most peaceful, open-minded person could reasonably express anger in that endeavor. Ultimately, I doubt measuring the usage of angry words is a reliable way of gauging dogmatism. I think the thought process behind this was likely that anger is often used in an appeal to emotion. That's a fallacy, and it's one that dogmatists use regularly. But still, simply measuring anger is a sloppy way of demonstrating dogmatism. Why not actually analyze the books for identifiable appeals to emotion rather than just expressions of emotion? It'd be difficult, time-consuming, but worth it for an actual valid result. So their claim to be so open-minded, non-dogmatic, is not doing so well. Let's look at the certainty category, uh, and here the effect is even starker. And here, actually, Dennett joins the new atheists, because he, too, uses these formulations. Certainly it is the case. It must be the case. It is always the case. But that's not the way scientists talk, but that's the way ideologues talk. That's the way moralists talk. That's what our righteous minds do. Again, are we sure that this is a reliable measure of dogmatism? Does this not come down more to word choice than anything? Just a minute ago, I purposely used this kind of phrasing to make a point. Sam Harris especially writes about ideologically countering terrorism. Surely even the most peaceful, open-minded person could reasonably express anger in that endeavor. Was that statement dogmatic? I could have just as easily asked, could he reasonably express anger in that endeavor, and meant the same thing. The only difference is that phrased as a question, my point would have not been detected by your method. However, the viewer could probably tell from the beginning that my original statement was just as non-dogmatic as my question. I think this was an attempt on Haidt's part to catch common fallacies that dogmatists use once again. In this case, an appeal to confidence, which is a type of appeal to authority. But like with measuring anger, I'm unconvinced that this is a reliable way to do that. In order to determine the regularity of that fallacy's use, you need to analyze the writing more intelligently than with a keyword search. Even beyond that, if you actually want to determine whether a group is dogmatic, take a look at their actions and lifestyles. What kind of social consequences are there for disagreeing? Are new ideas discouraged bitterly? Is there an internal or ideological structure which punishes or guilts dissenters? Are children forced to believe the same as their parents? Perhaps most importantly, is confidence encouraged and prized over rigorous acquisition of knowledge? Ask these questions of both the religious and atheists, and I think that you'll see striking disparity. I expect more than this from Height and other science communicators, and I hope that you do too. Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. Thank you guys so, so much for all of your support on Patreon. Once I announced my need for support, you guys got me to my goal in just one day. So like I said I would do, I've put in my two weeks notice at work and will be starting as a full-time YouTuber and activist as soon as I finish that out. 
a massive thank you to my top patron and personal lord and savior, Adam. To help me spread the love of Adam as he is commanded, subscribe, check out my Patreon, follow me on Twitter at GM Skeptic, and until next time, everyone, stay skeptical.